All right, last time we did it, we were, I used writing because every word was important. Um, for the last half of this class, I'm going to go through slides because it's much more of an overview of what's going on. So what we're going to do for the last part of this class is we're going to characterize simplifying assumptions made in building AI systems. We're going to determine what simplifying assumptions particular AI systems to do. And we're going to suggest what assumptions we could do to build more intelligent systems than existing ones. So as you can imagine, intelligence is a matter of degree. All right, so here's what we're going to do is we're going to define this in dimensions. So like you learned in physics, if you, learned, if you ever took physics, you know they're taught with very simplifying assumptions and they get more and more complicated. And that happens in every era, era of what we're doing. So research proceeds by making simplifying assumptions and gradually reducing them. So we start with the simplest case and then build up more and more complicated cases. So each simplifying assumption gives us a dimension of complexity. So when we simplify it, we can make something simpler or more difficult, and, make, and we can then we can um, and the multiple values in the dimension from simplex to from simple to complex, and then we're going to simplify assumptions are relaxed in various combinations, and that gives us a whole a whole space of possible designs. So here are the dimensions of complexity we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about modularity. With the work we're going to describe the world in terms of flat, modular, or hierarchical. In a planning horizon, whether we're talking about a non planning agent, one who only looks a finite number of steps ahead, an indefinite stages or infinite stages. We look at whether we represent the world in terms of states, in terms of features, or in terms of objects and relations. We look at computational limits, whether we talk about whether someone has perfect rationality, whether they can always compute the best the best outcome, or whether they have bounded rationality, where they also have to take into account computational limitations. Whether we're going to learn, whether knowledge is given to us or knowledge is going to be learned. Whether we have, whether we're going to fully observe the world or we can only partially observe the world. Whether the effects of actions are deterministic, so it can predict the effect of an action, or it's stochastic, there are random outcomes. Whether we have simple goals, like go get a coffee or have more complex preferences whether we're talking about single agents or multiple agents, and whether we're talking about an offline computation where we compute everything before, or we're, re or we're computing while we're reasoning, which is called online. So all of these are those dimensions of complexity. Now let's go through them more slowly. So the first dimension is modularity. So we can model at one level of abstraction, which we call flat. But if you're writing a program, you don't write that, you write modules. So we can module, to model something with interacting modules that can be understood separately is called a modular system. However, we can also module, model hierarchically, which says we model with modules and they're recursively decomposed into modules. That's called a hierarchical system. So here's an example. Suppose we want to plan a trip from here to see the Mona Lisa in Paris. Well, we could start reasoning at one level of abstraction, like what step should I take? And you're going to very quickly get into trouble because you can't do that. It's too complicated. You could either choose another high level abstraction, but that doesn't tell you which way should I walk, which way should I start doing, what should I actually start doing now? But if you're doing this, what, you'd rather, what you should do is to think about what do I need to get to, to see the Mona Lisa in Paris? Well, I need to get from here to Paris. Okay, so now I can start booking a flight from here to Paris, making sure I have the right visa and uh, the right quarantine. And then I'm going to work out what to do with, you know, how to get from here to the airport. Well, I need to book a taxi or book a car and park somewhere. Okay, so then I need to work about how to get from the airport in Paris to, the, to see the Mona Lisa. Well, I might, again, have to find my way to the subway, then to the, to where, the Louvre and then to see it. So, and then at lower levels, I can work out exactly what steps to do or what websites to check out. Okay, so flat systems, flat representations are adequate for simple systems. So, only simple systems are flat. Complex biological computation, computer systems, and organizations are all hierarchically. And a flat description is either continuous or discrete. So in other words, we talk about continuous variables. We're talking about discrete variables like have I arrived in Paris or what's the, it's a discrete one. Um, so hierarchical reasoning is often a mix between continuous and discrete. So it's called a hybrid system. So a lot of what we're going to do is we're going to start off with flat representations, but eventually we want to talk about hierarchical systems. 
So here's an interesting quote from Herb Simon, who's one of the, the first people, AI researchers, to win a Nobel Prize, and this was in economics. He says, by a hierarchic system or hierarchy, I mean a system that's being composed of interrelated subsystems, each of the latter being in turn hierarchic in structure until it reaches the somewhat, some lowest level of elementary subsystem. In both systems of nature, it is somewhat arbitrary as to where we leave off the partitioning, what subsystems we take as elementary. Physics makes much use of the concept of elementary particle, although the particles have a long, have a disconcerting tendency not to remain elementary very long. And this is the last part here is important for us. Em empirically, a large proportion of the complex systems we observe in nature exhibit hi hierarchical structure. On theoretic grounds, we'd expect complex systems to be hierarchies in a world in which complexity has to evolve from simplicity. So both empirically and theoretically, we'd want hierarchical systems. We're not actually going to talk much about hierarchical systems in this course, but it's important to know that we really need to extend it what we were doing to those. One of the things we are going to consider is this planning horizon, which is how far the agent looks into the future when deciding what to do. In the simplest version of this is the static world, which does not change. Then we're going to look, think about a finite state. So an agent reads in about a fixed finite number of time steps. The, the, a doctor might have two steps. They might do diagnosis and then they might do treatment. So that's a finite stage. Another horizon is the indefinite stage is your reason about a finite but not predetermined number of time steps. The robot might think about it has to get to deliver coffee and then it can stop worrying about it. Or an infinite stage, the agent plans on going on forever. So it's sort of process oriented. And so we're going to look at some cases about where we have infinite stages where the robot's got a plan on going on forever. The next part of this is about representations. So much of AI is about finding complex representations and exploiting the compactness for computational gains. So lots of different ways of representing the world. An agent can reason in terms of explicit states, where a state is just one way the world could be. It can then do, so we're going to, have to think about the terms of states, but often we want to describe the states in terms of features or propositions. And states can be described by features and 30 binary features can represent 2 to the 30, you know, over a billion states. So it's much easier to reason in terms of 30 features than it is to reason in terms of billions of states. And many problems have thousands, if not millions, of features, and that the number of states is just enormous, even though it's the number of states is what we're at, the state of the world is what we might be interested in. We want to describe it in terms of features. But then most features come from individuals and relations. And so then there's a feature for every relationship of every tuple of every individual. We might be uncertain about someone, person's mark in a particular assignment in a course, and that might be a feature. But then there's the, there's the objects in there, the individuals who are the, the, the student and the course and the assignment, and then the relations amongst them. And that's what's going to end up building our features from individuals and relations. So often, an agent can reason without knowing the individuals or whether infinitely many individuals. And so typically in this course, we're going to cover features or propositions. A lot of the representations are going to be feature based, but we really eventually, we really want to talk about individuals and relations. The next one is computational limits, per whether the agent can determine the best course of action without taking into account its limited computational resources. So what we can do is just think about what's the optimal answer to this question, and that would be just perfect rationality. But agents are not perfect. They have to make good decisions based on perceptual computation and memory limitations. You can't actually observe what's in the world. You can't compute forever, and we have memory limitations. And taking that into account is called bounded rationality. So we're going to see some examples of bounded rationality um, in here. All right. The next part is whether we learn whether the model is specified a priori, in which case the knowledge is given, but more typically knowledge is learned from data or past experiences. So in here we're going to think about whether we, the agent is given the knowledge that, ha, that has to know or that learns it from data and past experiences. And it's always some mix of prior, what we call innate or programmed knowledge and learning. So in psychology there's a big debate about nature versus nurture, and that's what this is about. So most of this course is about the first one, and if you want to learn about, know about learning, there are 
courses in machine learning um, offered for, and I'm sure a number of you are taking it or will take it. All right. And it turns out that learning is impossible without some prior knowledge. And the part that prior knowledge is a lot of what this course is about. In statistics, they call this the bias. Okay. Then there's the uncertainty dimensions. And there are two dimensions for uncertainty. In each dimension, the agent can have no uncertainty where you know what's true. It can just be distinct, disjunctive uncertainty. You know, there's a set of states that are possible. Or there's a probability distribution over the worlds. And we're going to start off here. We're going to talk about no uncertainty. And then we're going to eventually talk about what to do when we have probability in here. So agents need to act even if they're uncertain. And the predictions need to decide what to do. So if someone gives you a definitive prediction, you will be run over tomorrow, or you will not be run over tomorrow, do not believe them. Okay, so if you act like you'll be run over tomorrow, then you'll sit in hiding away, um, or won't do anything. If you think you won't be run over tomorrow, well, then you go and be risky and you might get run over. So it's better to have, you can think about disjunctions, be careful or you'll be run over. It actually turns out to be more useful to know the probability you'll be run over tomorrow is 0.002 if you're careful and 0.005 or 0.05 if you're not careful. So it's better the probabilities are going to be useful. Well, the two main arguments, two main reasons for it, one is that acting is gambling. Whenever you act, we're gambling. Um, agents who don't use probability will lose to those who do. There are theorems that basically say that. So probability is the calculus of gambling, and every time you act under uncertainty, you're gambling. Anytime an agent acts under uncertainty, it's gambling. Probabilities can be learned from data and prior knowledge. So we need both data and prior knowledge to build these probabilities, and it's well-defined calculus that we're going to see how to do that. So we're going to probabilities to are going to underlie the last half of this course. There's two different cases we're going to look at. Is one is whether the agent can determine a state from its stimuli. So it's the agent's fully observable if it can observe the state of the world. So if when it observes it, it finds out what state of the world it's in. If it's only partially observable, there can be a number of states that are possible given the agent's stimuli. So lots of toy examples are fully observable. For example, games might be fully observable. You get to observe the state of the game. So um, you might observe if you're building a something to scheduling for trucks, maybe you get to observe the state of every truck. But for nearly every other case, it's only partially observable. In a game, you don't actually observe all the hidden states. A robot doesn't actually observe you know, everything that's in the world that's not in its field of view. When a teacher is teaching something, they don't get to know, observe the state of all of the students. So. We somehow have to act even then. So the last, the other one is, the other part of uncertainty is effect uncertainty. It answers the question, if an agent knew the initial state and its action, could it predict the resulting state? Well, the dynamics then can be deterministic. So the resulting state is determined from the action and the state. So that means that's de deterministic dynamics as you can actually predict the result from your action and your state. Or stochastic is there's some uncertainty about the resulting state. So even if you knew what state you were in, if the agent knew what state it was in, and and knew what action it was taking, it could not actually predict the resulting state. That's going to be stochastic. And we're going to talk about that a lot, um, particularly now when we have planning. We're going to do planning, first of all, under the deterministic assumption, and then we're going to have probability distributions over the effects of actions. We're going to talk about stochastic domains. Then there's the preferences of the agent, is what does the agent try to achieve? And there's, we're going to look at some cases where there's an achievement goal, there's just a goal to achieve. And this can be some complex logical formula. So it could be bring the, the bring someone coffee and don't mess up the lab. So something like that. So it's an achievement goal. And the other one is some complex preferences where we have trade-offs between various things we may desire, perhaps even at different times. So there's two cases for few two cases for complex preferences. One is ordinal only the order matters. I would prefer coffee over tea and I'd prefer to have it quickly rather than slowly. And there's cardinal where the absolute values also matter. So I'm going to trade off taste and speed and hotness. Okay. So my coffee delivery robot, it could be have just bring me 
coffee is just an achievement goal, but it also could be something much more complicated to do with the cost and the risks associated with making the possibility of spilling and the possibility of it being cold. And the medical doctor has very complicated preferences because they have a preference for, you could say, just heal this person, cure this person. But that's not the goal of a doctor. There's all these cost trade-offs between the, the, the desire to live a better life, the number of days people are going to live, the cost to society, the cost to the patient, and all sorts of other trade-offs that people do. So we're going to talk about, so part of the last part of the course, we're going to talk about complex preferences. Initially, we're going to just talk about achievement goals. Then there's a number of agents, and the question is, are there multiple reasoning agents that need to be taken into account? So nearly all this course, we're going to talk about single agent reasoning. We're going to treat all other agents as part of the environment. Multiple agent reasoning, so an agent reads strategically about the agent of re reasoning of another agent, is much more complicated. Um, so agents can have their own goals that can be cooperative, competitive, and goals can be independent of each other, and ends up that when we talk about multiple agent reasoning, it's much more complicated than the single agent reasoning we're going to cover in this course. Then the last one is the interaction dimension. So when does the agent reason to determine what to do? Reason offline before acting, so you sit and think about what the right answer is, then you act and do it, or do you have to reason online while interacting with the environment? So here are the um, dimensions again. So the so there's the modularity, the planning horizon, the representation, the computational limits, whether learning, whether we have sensing uncertainty, effect uncertainty, whether we have the preferences we have, the number of agents, whether we have a single agent or multiple agents, whether we do online or offline. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the simplest in all of these, except we're going to have indefinite stages. So we're going to look at what's called state space search. We're going to talk about the a flat system, there's going to be no hierarchy. There's going to be indefinite stages. We're going to ask for multiple steps. We're going to look at whether the case with this sta states. We're going to look at perfect rationality. We're assuming we're given the knowledge. The world is fully observable. The, the effects are deterministic. We have goals to achieve. We have you know, a single agent and we're interacting offline. So we don't have to think about what to do online. Then later on, we actually get to the stage of deterministic planning. We sort of do planning in terms of features. Remember that features can be much more compact than reasoning in terms of states. We look at later on, we're going to look at decision networks, which are finite stage. So we're going to go from indefinite just to finite stage. We're going to talk about features. We're going to talk about perfect rationality and knowledge is given. But now we're going to look at the partially observable, stochastic with complex preferences and still single agents and offline. So that's what we're sort of going to end up with looking at in this course. Okay, so so let's so so that's all for now. I'll talk to you soon in our class. Bye.